Welcome to our continuing series, Explorations in Savitri, as always with our beloved Alok Bhai. We begin a new series today in which we will give brief summaries of all the 48 cantos and also speak of the main characters in the poem. There are not so many. You know, Savitri is the greatest gift ever given to the world from the greatest poet. And Mother said it would take a hundred years for people to begin to understand Savitri. Well, more than fifty have passed since he wrote it. Well, yeah. So we go <laughs> to <laughs> book one. You wanted to read something else also? Book of Beginnings. Yes. Canto one. The symbol dawn. Where we first hear of Savitri. Yes. Yes. And that to me is very significant because <clears throat> the book ends with, with this very enigmatic line. This was, this the, day. was the day when Satchipan must die. Yes. So he sets us. It's not the story yet. Yes, and not only that, it's enigmatic at a deeper level. Yes. Often we, I mean, it's a, in a sense, valid question. Uh, at another level, a childish question. That why we have to go through all this drama and process. The divine is all powerful. So he need not, you know, he can just uh, magically do something. Like, why must Satyavan die? So, uh, there, is, there are many levels at which we can understand it because there is an emphasis on the word must. And why? It's not must, will die, yes. should die. Why must the Divine why? Mother ah. have to take on the sorrows and griefs of the world? Yes. So, Satyavan must die. It's, it's basically, uh, there are many ways one can understand it. But one of the simple ways that I look at it is that we have to die to the old consciousness to be born to the new. And unless we do that, we cannot have the, the transformation cannot happen. So there is a whole phase when the old is gone and the new is not yet there, which is like a transition phase. And during that phase, we have to learn to just completely surrender to her. That's what Satyavan does. Yes. And, in the old, and it's very beautifully described what is the old consciousness and what will be the new consciousness. So Satyavan is in a, an eminent, a shreshtha, a noble, an Arya if you want to use the word. But there is one problem. When he discovers the self, he forgets, loses matter. Yes. And when he is with matter, he loses the spirit. So the old consciousness is a consciousness that creates an unbridgeable gulf yes. between material reality and the spiritual. Yes. And he says to her, but now the gold link yes, has comes come. to me with thy feet. Yes. See. So now because there is a gulf, we had the old division of spirituality between spiritual life and material yes. life. Now this gulf is created by whom? Actually there is in, from that other perspective there is no gulf. From the divine consciousness point of view. There is no gulf because it's all one. But there is a gulf within the human consciousness. And this gulf is filled with the grey of night. And that is death. Yes. It has created a gulf, unbridgeable gulf. That's why we will see that as Savitri proceeds with death, death starts conceding little by little. Mm. At the end he says, all right, you be with Satyavan. You want Satyavan? You be with Satyavan. Go up into up. the heavens yes. beyond. Yes. But don't ask him to come down here because he knows that if that happens, the gulf will be bridged. Exactly. So this is the gulf from where Savitri starts in the book of beginnings. Yes. Yes. And that's why Satyavan must die because if he stays with the old consciousness, because this is a practical I mean, uh, issue in, in everyday life. We want to hold on to both. And transformation doesn't work out like that. I mean... Any part in us which owes its allegiance to the old 
and there are plenty of it, them, cannot be taken up into the new. Yes. So therefore Satyavan must die within each one of us. So we start with the symbol. We'll just read few lines, a passage here, there yes. and go as yes. it flows. Yes. Maybe after the first two cantos, when the foundation is laid, we can introduce, you know, who are the characters, the characters. Ah, and good. see how it goes. Good. It's good to keep space for the divine inspiration. That's why two rigid form forms. <laughs> so the symbol dawn, as we see, it's a symbol and um, dawn is the first goddess they invoked, uh, the Vedic Rishis invoked. And she is the first goddess because she brings the, not the illumination per se, but the clear sign and indication that the illumination is going to be. Exactly. Yeah. Dawn, dawn is not about the light. Actually, you don't see the light, but you know the light. You feel the light, you sense the light. Yes. So she is, she is the, she is, if, if we have the dawn, we know it is the coming of light. Sun is not far behind. To use a phrase from, you know, Keats, paraphrase. Yes. That if dawn is near, sun is not far behind. Yes. So similarly we see that uh, mother and Shurabindu in their own life, because very often people ask this question, where is the supramental? So they are the heralds of the dawn. They have announced it's going to come. It's right there. And now for it to fully emerge into the play, it will take a gap of time. So the dawn arrives. But not before there is a fight. Yes. In individual life, in collective life. And if you see in Savitri itself, I mean in the birth of Savitri, as you said, Shubhinda had to redo it. And it's an earlier draft is in Baroda. But then 1916 is supposed to be the officially first draft, whatever it means. <laughs> the attempt at a perfect perfection. Perfection. But there is a big gap, there is a whole night which intercedes, the two world wars. Exactly. And then there is the final birth which Shobindo yeah. takes up and, uh, you know. And he uh, even writes to Amal, I guess it was, I have no time for savagery yes, now. Yes, which was most, and he said it's in my most important work. Yes. So we see the same truth being revealed here. It was the hour before the gods awake. Now, not going into the details of the lines, but even if we connect it to Shurabindo's coming and the supramental creation, you will read uh, one of the very interesting uh, prayers of the mother, prayers and meditations, where she speaks of these brilliant gods whose hour has come. And then yeah. he, she speaks of the intelligence, the rapid activity of the intelligence which is now trying to create new forms. So that is the time if we see that first part of the previous century, suddenly there was a spurt of activity in every field. In the field of pure physics, in the field of biology, yes. in the field of, uh, in the geopolitical situations there was suddenly a burst of activity, as if a change is going to come. So these gods were as if uh, restless, they were wanting to take birth, and the human consciousness was getting churned. But, and there is a but, across the path of the divine event, the huge foreboding mind of night, alone, in her unlit temple of eternity, lay stressed immobile upon silence, march. So, Mother very beautifully says, what is this divine event? It is creation itself. Yes. And uh, closer to us, we may say it is the new creation. <laughs> but there is the huge foreboding mind of night. Yeah. It is not ready. It has, it, it has a grip uh, on the human consciousness, the earth consciousness. Why? You know, it's a very interesting phrase. Mind of night. Yes. Is there a mind in the night? Yes. So here mind is being used as a power of extreme division. So night is not just nothing. There is a power active within it which is a power of extreme division. Yes. 
and it has divided, divided, divided everything up to the infinitesimal. Nothing is awake. And we see that yes. in these lines, yes. these coming lines. In the unlit temple of eternity, yeah. the, the psychic must be lit, the flame must be lit, yes. Yes. the deity established, yes. the ego dethroned. So all these are processes of yoga. Almost one felt opaque, impenetrable. In the somber symbol of her eyeless muse, the abysm of the unbodied infinite, a fathomless zero occupied the world. So I wonder how Shubhendra the mother would have felt at that point of time. Opaque, impenetrable. Who was feeling? It's very interesting. He says, almost one felt. Giving the impression there is one who feels that everything is opaque, impenetrable. Sometimes in the evening talks when we read. And I just wonder, see now we are so fortunate. We have uh, all the letters, we have the books, we have uh, everything ready-made, served to us. Yes. So the first disciples, when Shubhinda was speaking of supermind, what they would have gathered? Yeah. Next to nothing, even now, you know, we wonder. And he says, you would not understand. <laughs> would not understand. Yes. Opaque, impenetrable. Nobody would have probably even believed. Yeah. Even though they had trust in Shurabindu and the mother, but they would have wondered, what is this? And almost one felt. Sometimes you feel that Shurabindu is identified, gone there, and he is feeling that this is so opaque. This is my field. Here I have to work. And what was the possibility that brought them down at this point. Yes. Thick of darkness. Sun is nearest when all is dark. If you see 1900, yeah. I mean, if you look at the field of science, at the field of spirituality, at the field of philosophy, everywhere, psychology, politics, it's thick, dense darkness. Yes. So sun has to come yes. and announce itself. But then, this is something which is not being done for the first time. Right. So, he reveals to us a power of fallen, boundless, self-awake. Between the first and the last nothingness. So, these are the two rivers which will come later on as rivers. So, the first nothingness is of course the superconscient, in which everything is there as a potential. But, not many face, nothing. You can't define it, you can't describe it. Neti neti. And the last nothingness, this is also nothing. Because everything is there but only hidden, concealed. You can't see it, it's nothing. So between them, there is a boundless cell which is there in it, which is beginning to become awake. Yeah. So it's very interesting that in that unlit temple of eternity, uh, God himself is waking up. You know that uh, vision of the mother before yes. coming to Pondicherry, yes. where she sees, she goes down into the depths of the inconscient, sees this great being lying and sleeping. Yes. And from his sleep, he is creating the worlds. And then when she goes, he wakes up, he opens the eyes. Hiranyakarpa. And then she says that uh, he was, he is the first avatar. He is the first descent which took place. We don't even know. Because when we speak of the parable of the ten avatars, it is only for this cycle of creation. There have been many cycles. Many and we see that in this canto. Yes, yes, we can see that. So, there have been cycles. Even before the Vedas, before the Chaldean legion, mm -hmm. there have been cycles of creation where the effort has taken place. But the first descent of the divine entering into the inconscient. From there the whole thing starts. And he opens his eyes. He opens the eyes. Recalling the tenebrous womb from which it came, turned from the insoluble mystery of birth and the tardy process of mortality and longed to reach its end in vacant knot. So there is a tendency because everything is emerging from the inconscient to collapse back into it. So it 
turns away from this insoluble mystery of birth. So very often the so-called celebrated Vairagya in Indian thought <laughs> is not a very healthy thing. <laughs> Basically it means that you find birth and life a terror and you know you don't like it, it's difficult, the challenge is too much. So people take different routes to turn back and one of them is this route. That, what is the point? Mm. So it has a tendency to go back into the vacant knot and now come few lines and then we'll go to some other yeah. passage because they again fill us with hope. As in a dark beginning of all things, a mute, featureless semblance of the unknown, repeating forever the unconscious act, prolonging forever the unseen will, cradled the cosmic drowse of ignorant force, whose moved creative slumber kindles the suns and carries our lives in its somnambulist world. You see, it's very interesting. Actually, every revelation of Sri Aurobindo, and Savitri, of course, is the profoundest of the profound. There are several ways you can see it. it these few lines you can build into a whole metaphysical system of thought. Uh, of course, very simple that the first beginnings are just uh, like a mechanical patterns of nature, uh, which probably have not even taken a form. And these patterns of energy will eventually precipitate as a form. So he's describing the very beginning of things before form is formed, <laughs> to put it that way. You can also take it as um, when we first strive towards something. I always love to take out uh, psychological meanings within it because it's practical, it connects to us. So uh, all beginnings are dark. So we should not be disheartened or give up. Second, in the beginning, there is a tendency to perpetuate the old ways, mechanically whatever is happening. So many times people ask this question, what is this? I see, you know, people are making a cult, going to samadhi, they are doing this gesture, that gesture, bowing down, putting flowers. No, no, we should read these lines. In the beginning, we go through the same process because we have a background forever repeating the unconscious act yes. you know we go to the temple and we offer the flowers whether there is anything in the heart or not not realizing that when we do the same act here the power that is carrying us in the somnambulist world will touch us at one yes. place mother says my child the very fact when people go round the samadhi just literally the round they cannot help but being touched by the supramental force. So that is the other way of looking at it, that the very fact, even mechanically when they come, and it strikes you sometimes, it's amazing, you know, how, I mean, it's always humbling experience and chastening experience. So I met someone, recently, five, six months back, they came to know of Mother and Shirobindo, and this man looks so uncouth, as if he has not even properly take, taken a proper bath and, you know, that kind of. And he suddenly came and did namaste to me and I said, yes, good morning, how are you? So he said, oh, I've been watching your videos and I feel so much from, I've started feeling so much for mother and I, this is the first time I have come. I said, okay, you want something? He said, yes, I want to meet you. I want to know more about mother. <laughs> so he came. So I asked him that, uh, what do you do for a living? Because, you know, I was just wondering that. Uh, and what he said was so interesting. He said, I sell alcohol. Daru <laughs> I said, mother, there is still in me that old fellow who can get shocked. And I said, who is this fellow? <laughs> and then, but I was so happy what a straightforward man. Yeah. He said, I sell alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> and then he told me something very interesting, which again, you know, he says, you know what, I tried different things. I failed in all. <laughs> but this one has succeeded. And I look after my family. 
I said, good. It's okay. I mean, <laughs> what else to say? <laughs> you know, imagine. And then he added, you know, he felt that I may feel bad. He said, but I don't take anything. I said, <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> and I was reminded of Udar Das story. You know Udar Das story. How divine has included all kinds of beings, you know. Doesn't matter. People so much, you know, become judgmental. Somebody is going and bowing. This is nothing. This is at least a, if nothing else, a religious act, which is still, you know, got a uh, meaning. So Udharda <laughs> used to offer drinks to some of these people. Mm -hmm. Ashram people. That time, you know, whoever were there. Ambu so they also. Were, ah, Ambu yeah. also. So, so one day, when mother asked, what is this? So he said, mother, there is so and so person. Uh, what was his name? I'm forgetting. First name. Uh, anyway, said he gives us drinks. So he said, who is this Pinto giving drinks to my children? I want to meet him. And that was the end of Mr. Pinto and the beginning of Udar. So you see how concealed behind all yes, this, yes. there is a deeper truth which is waiting to express itself. So we look at the pattern, somnambulist world, oh, these people every day, they are going, what is this round and round? I know of an alcoholic who used to take only thing round and round the ashram. Yes, he used to do only that. But tremendous intelligence. Once I told him, you know, why are you doing this? He says, so you are being judgmental. I said, my God, this fellow is, you know, I have to be. <laughs> you are being judgmental. You know, Mother and Shubhinda were not judgmental. I said, yes, I, I am afraid I made a mistake. Though I had no such intention of judging you. <laughs> I had a very medical question that why don't you give it up? Later on he came because of issues. So we should not be disheartened by appearance as in a dark beginning of all things. And also then, you know, the next page. So we have transition of images from dense darkness, darkness, grayness. And then when the time comes, it's a sudden process. You know, this again, yes. when mother was asked that, you know, we try and try and sometimes nothing happens. He said, still you keep trying. Yes. She said, what happens is that all this intensity keeps mounting up. Till one day, suddenly the door opens and you step into the light. Now, people think that moment is the sudden moment and therefore it's what is important. But they don't see that days and weeks and months and years. A long time. Dim preparation is yeah, man's, man's life. life. They have just sat yes. before the door and the door won't open. Yes. So we have this, well, I'm sure you... I'd like to start uh, with... Um, yeah. It was as though, yeah. even in its noughts profound, even in this ultimate dissolution's core, there lurked an unremembering entity, survivor of a slain and buried past, condemned to resume the effort and the pang reviving in another frustrate world. Yes. An unshaped consciousness desired light Whoa. and a blank prescience yearned towards distant change. And now these and lines. Then, as if a childlike finger laid on a cheek, reminded of the endless need in things, the heedless mother of the universe, an infant longing clutched the somber vast. So this he heedless continued. mother, material yes, nature, yes, yes. she is just not in a need awakens, endless need. Yes. So even desire becomes a propelling, endless need. I need this, I need that. Slowly, slowly she wakes up. And then we have in the next page, that darkness slipped. Yeah, there it is. But those lines and darkness slipped and fade like a falling cloak from the reclining body of a god. So that is where we see <clears throat> and uh, another very interesting so there is a long passage there, there are a number of transition of images many, many transitional images where um, we see one after another, the dawn, once it comes, it awakens the light, and then a time comes when suddenly everything becomes ablaze and awake, and the yagna starts. You know, that next page on page 4, we have toward the end, 
that the divine mother finally comes so dawn arrives then the divine mother comes and then what happens after that is wonderful all grew a consecration and a right now this i see as the book of yoga so what happens in yoga this is exactly the process first there is a kind of dawn a sense ah so nice admiration oh there is a new new thought wonderful but it's not yet yoga then it whatever time passes depending on a preparation a time comes when suddenly there is a recognition of the divine mother and very interestingly i was uh, reading once mother says that one should come to me after a long preparation coming to me is not the beginning a time comes and most of the time i see most people take time to recognize the divine mother but once she touches a form from far beatitudes came to near then the yagna starts she kindles to fire then there is the true initiation so there are there is a preparatory stage even in yoga where there is a mental illumination like the dawn you feel there is something but you don't quite hold it grasp it it's tangible and yet intangible you know it is there and yet you don't see it it is a face and one can linger in that face for long but a time comes when the divine mother <clears throat> touches her feet onto a matter yes. material life this embodied existence and that is what is being described here a form from far beatitude seem to near ambassadors twixt eternity and change the omniscient goddess leaned across the breadth so she is the one who mediates between the human soul and the supreme there is no other way so we see this uh, then the yagna starts and then one by one the experiences come i this consecration yeah. and a right yes when i was going back to the us mother wrote to me something i didn't know anything about consecration at the age of 23 yes of course she writes keep living in you the spirit of consecration and all will be all right wonderful what did i know that is the yoga the whole that. yoga is a yagna yeah and then something very interesting but the big problem is to keep this fire alive and that's what we have on the next page <clears throat> only a little the god light can stay i think this line itself says it all yes and the reason is that human clay is not ready we should not look at it as a fault or a defect or guilt it's that human clay is not ready so after a while the flesh tires cannot respond and so the light tends to retire a drawback or it diffuses becomes common place yes you know we get so habituated to it that we do not look at it we start the light is there but we are going as he describes on the next page all sprang to their unwearing daily acts yes it's the tragedy but we, we see but we still it says this this line about <coughs> um Where is it now? Yeah. yeah. A sacred yearning yes. lingered in its trace. So it does that. It yes. it keeps the heart it opens the heart yeah. to the yearning, to the aspiration, to the seeking, longing which will in turn prepare everything once again. Yeah. so the first touch is the touch of the fire touch of the sun there is an instant glow which all of us experience it like the initiatory ritual if you want to say it ritual in the deepest sense the right right yes then the rest of the members have to become ready so that's where there is a diffusion of light and this is a very common problem at least you know uh, people don't understand like living in pondicherry for example there are two sides to it one is that there is a tremendous light and power which no doubt 
But precisely because of that, sometimes very difficult for human consciousness to all the time assimilate it. So there is a tendency to start going about your life in the everyday yes. process. So the common light of earthly day. Yes. And we have that description on the next page. All sprang to their unwearying daily acts. So you know there is a light. It has come. This power is there to help yeah. us. But after some time, we get so used to it, so accustomed to it. Habit. Habit. So we spring up to our daily unwearying acts. The thousand peoples of the soil and tree obeyed the unforeseen instant's urge. Hmm. And leader here with his uncertain mind, alone who stares at the future's covered face, man lifted up. The burden of his feet. I think the other day I was reading something from the mother. She says, my child, when you are in difficulty, why don't you call me? And then she says, I don't know why you don't call me. I am here to help you. It happens to that extent. Man lifted up the burden of his feet. He thinks he has to do it. There is no other way because of habit. Yes. We cannot trust the grace enough with our, let's say, worldly issues. Because we think that, you know, divine is only for the other worldly things. It's amazing. But she says that for everything, if nothing else, you will come in contact with me. That's the, the other, minimum. The other day, someone said, had a problem and said to me, I can't resolve it. I just can't get out of it. I said, call mother. Boom, it was gone. Absolutely. Immediately it was gone. It is so simple. Countless times this experience comes. Yes. And yet, equally countless times we go back to the same old stupid nature. Unvarying daily Unvarying acts. Unvarying daily acts. Man lifted up the burden of his feet. And then we see the symbol, full sense of the symbol, and Savitri to evoke among these tribes. She becomes like us, which you were mentioning. The Divine Mother becomes like one of yes. us. Yes. But the difference... And the difference between somebody who is, um, you know, often people describe who is doing sadhana, who is not doing sadhana. I mean, apart from the absurdity of this question at a deepest level. But it's the inner attitude with which you approach life. What is your focus? What is your most important thing in life? So the difference is described very beautifully. That while people wake up and they are lured by the apparent ways, she finds, desire comes to her also, but is a sweet and alien note. Yes. It comes. It touches her. Visited her heart. Ah, yes. So that's what we see here. It has nothing to do with anything external. And tribes. Beautiful. Yeah. The human family. Yes. The tribes. Tribes. <laughs> yes. So, time's message of brief light was not for her. In her, there was the anguish of the gods. Imprisoned in our transient human mold, the deathless conquered by the death of things. So, when we are conscious of the soul, when we are conscious of the divine presence, then in a certain sense the real yoga starts. That's what Sri Bindu says. Because then you realize, what is this? Anomaly, what is this great contradiction between who you really are in your essence and this into which you are drawn, into which you are dragged again and again, this nature to which you are tried, tied, this blindness, this ignorance which the members are steeped in. So she experiences that great division between who she is and the nature, the boundaries of nature, the limits of nature, the obscurity which the avatar has taken upon herself. So, same we saw about the coming of light and we saw that how it diffuses into earth nature. We have on the next page the same thing with regard to human nature. When the touch of light through the avatar comes, how human beings react to it. How Hard is, is it, it to yes. persuade earth nature yes. change? You know, sometimes, sometimes I see, read, hear some of these stories they uh, they are at the same time on one side stories of tremendous compassion and love 
एट द सेम टाइम इन देम देर इज अ डिवाइन पैथॉस दर डे समबडी वॉज टेलिंग मी दिस स्टोरी ऑफकोर्स टेलिंग इट वेरी ह्यूमरसली एंड दर इज अमर पार्ट ऑफ इट सम वन हु वुड स्मोक एंड स्मोक क्वाइट क्वाइट बिट एंड द जोक यूज टू बी दैट ही वुड से दैट वेल गिविंग अप स्मोकिंग इट्स वेरी इजी I give it up every day. So <laughs> every day he gives up, and next day he starts. And uh, mother told him something very interesting. She said, "Okay, if you can't give up, fine. But when you have smoked, don't come near me at that time." To another sadhak, to whom this man shared the story, he caught the second part of the story. See how you can take the same story. Yes. Yes. one person would say oh mother mother had accepted it's okay you know we can smoke but the other one took the other part of the story that don't come near don't me come if near i smoke i put a wall between me and her so the second person also used to smoke and he took it as an inspiration to give up smoking yeah. so yeah. human nature it it's but each one has his own shibolith as the mother says which one is not ready to give up it it uh, it fears the pure divine intolerance of that assault of ether and of fire so this is the assault of kali which he cannot bear he finds her too strong too hard and he murmurs. It murmurs at its sorrowless happiness almost with hate repels the light it brings i remember in the beginning when i came and there was some issue and some very old people uh, people who had lived here for many decades and uh, something was going on very mundane and i said you must have read what shubhinda has said you know oh oh don't tell me all that i was surprised at the re- response i said did i hear it right this mother sashram somebody has so much resistance to what shubhinda if nothing else even if you have heard you don't even know what i am going to say you would normally say oh okay you you become quiet because you know it's mother and shubhin those words but you know this it repels with hate the light that it brings yeah. it's very strange something inexplicable it trembles at its naked power of truth and the might and sweetness of its absolute voice very difficult to obey and surrender very difficult for for most if not many that what shurbindo has said is truth and it is not the other way round when people are is it true well if shurbindo says so it is true yes i remember one very simple uh, anecdote of vk gokak he was i think vice chancellor and, and he was also a, of course professor in english <laughs> and it seemed someone asked him once is it english do you think that what you know is it english that should be is writing i mean what kind of english is this and he said it is not english that should be the rights what should be the rights is english yes i remember <laughs> so, that yes yes go kak now that should be our approach yes. you know if we really take them <laughs> as our master i mean leaving aside that they are much more than master is the end of the story life can be so simple and beautiful mother says so that's the end of the story but it does not absolute voice no i must also have a voice yeah. <laughs> democracy freedom <laughs> don't quote mother to me <laughs> don't quote mother to me <laughs> i am a law unto myself <laughs> freedom yes. she has given freedom not realizing she has also said what is freedom <laughs> she has given me yes <laughs> yes yes <laughs> from our own ego desires <laughs> there is a whole list of things we have to be free from and uh, Uh, you know nolini once called me to his office and he said mother wanted me to tell you something she gives you total freedom in this ashram but with it comes complete responsibility yes <laughs> <laughs> uh, so beautiful also because that is necessary because then it's authentic if something is forced upon you as a code of conduct then the problem is that whatever change comes is not authentic yes each part has to freely choose to change that is a big challenge of transformation so it's not like a religious code which is what happens to every movement 
After some time, you will see that it turns into a code. A moral code. Moral of, code, yes. ethical code, yes, or, yes. you know, simply a religious code. Yes. Mother said so, mother mm -hmm. does not like, mother likes, which is not what it should become. Even people start pointing to the dress, pointing toward this, pointing toward that. So I remember once long back, somebody had come to my class and another person pointed out, oh, how come you are wearing this kind of t-shirt in the ashram? So she asked me, I said, see, this is the irony of life, that you have come for the Savitri class, your attention is on the Divine Mother and Savitri, somebody's attention is on your t-shirt. <laughs> so I said, to each his own, <laughs> that is the freedom. What else to say? I mean, if, if you have nothing better to see but seeing your t-shirt, it's miserable that Savitri's talk is going on and, you know, if nothing else, mother's picture is there, but you are worried about what t-shirt somebody is wearing. Dressing inappropriately, inappropriately for, the for the ashram. So all these, you know, fortunately not, see most people who have grown up in this culture understand. Let me tell you that. Instinctively, this is my experience having dealt with number of yeah. old ashramites. But some, there is a small band, but... Unfortunately, a very, you know, vocal. <laughs> yes, <laughs> very vocal, very much at crucial places, every, at every gate, uh, you have the stone eyed <laughs> stone law. law. Stone eyed <laughs> law. Right at the post where you don't want to meet, there you will meet. But rest of the people are very wonderful, you know. <laughs> so, so, this is what he is cautioning also on the same page. A glory of lightnings traversing the earth scene, their sun thoughts fading, darkened by ignorant minds, their work betrayed, their good to evil turned, the cross, their payment for the crown they gave. And now see the pathos in this line. Yeah. Oh. Only they leave behind splendid. a splendid name. You see the avatars? Lord Rama, Lord Rama. Krishna, Krishna, but see what the, what is done. Yes. Buddha, the mighty Buddha. Yes. What they have done to the avatars. Christ, Shubhendra says, on his tomb they erected a religion. Yeah. So, this what should not happen and I am sure this won't happen because this time the Divine Mother has seen to it. We will see to it that it doesn't happen. I think we will stop here and see.